will so the we do the curtain at like two. the only one that I okay. have. We keep it for now. Okay. I spoke with Jaina. Hello everyone. Hello, hello. Hi everybody. So I'm uh, happy to see such a lively discussion going on uh, before our uh, event today and we are very uh, fortunate to bring Cecilia Vecuña today uh, in conversation with Macarena Gomez Baris. So I'll do a short introduction of the event and then um, I'll pass the microphone off to Maka who will do a, a longer introduction into the um, the contents of today's um, today. This event is brought to you by the Global South Center and uh, the Social Science and Cultural Studies uh, Department. It is also part of the Crit Viz uh, Critical and Visual Studies Symposium. Uh, it is the minor in a uh, major in our department um, that's thriving, and you can see that by the number of students who are here today. Hey guys. Um, um, I also want to introduce the two new professors that are um, at this point. Uh, 
very new but very deeply affiliated with the Global South Center. Um, we have Nurhaizatul Jamil, um, a assistant professor of Global South Studies. Um, and we have Wendy Munoz, assistant professor of Social and Media Analysis. Um, we also have uh, many other professors here today. The reasons that they are being introduced is that they are new and we want to welcome them to Pratt. Um, another reason uh, is that I want to highlight that uh, we are la launching over the past um, few weeks, we've been working on launching the Social Media Lab and Wendy and Zat are instrumental in launching that lab. Uh, today, I believe, and guys correct me if I'm wrong, um, this is the first time we are live streaming the event uh, via the Facebook. Um, there will be uh, multiple hashtags associated with the event uh, that will uh, circulate on all social media platforms, right? So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and so forth. Uh, they're exhibited on the... Um, on the posters that you see around the room, um, so it's hashtag Kipu, hashtag Loprecario, uh, hashtag Decolonial, and hashtag Extractive Zones. Um, so just as um, an introduction, and uh, Zat and Wendy will be live tweeting during um, the event as well. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, what I want to say uh, about the event. Um, let me just briefly introduce, uh, first of all, um, I am, my name is Luca. Um, I am a, uh, I'm a professor in the uh, Social Science and Cultural Studies Department. I also, uh, together with Maka, um, co-organize the events and the activities of the Global South Center. Um, and today, as I mentioned earlier, we have an honor to have Cecilia Vicuña here with us today. Um, Um, Cecilia Vicuña is a Chilean visual artist, activist, and poet um, who, whose work addresses ecological um, destruction, human rights, and cultural homogenization. Um, she currently has an uh, exhibition on at the Brooklyn Museum, you might have seen it, um, and it goes on until November 25th, I believe. Um, it's called The Disappeared Kipu, um, and if you have not seen it yet, you still have plenty of time to go and do so. Um, so, um, I will leave the rest of the introduction um, to Maka, um, and uh, yeah, Maka. Again? Technical glitch. <laughs> so, yay, done. So it's great to see so many of you here. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to say that Cecilia, Cecilia Vicuña is an extraordinary artist, a multimedia artist, and a poet originally from Chile. And she's been working on uh, weaving on, with fabric, with the notion of precarity, on sculptural work, on ecological themes uh, for the past 40 years um, and been doing this work uh, on her own in her studio sometimes and recently has gotten um, a lot more attention for it. She's also the author of a dozen or more works of poetry, including Instun in 2002, Cloudnet in 1999. Um, Unraveling Words in the Weaving of Water, 1992, one of my favorite, Precario, Precarious, 1983, and Sabo Rami, 1974, and this was reissued uh, with an afterword in 2011. Uh, she's also the editor of the Oxford Book of Latin American Poetry, a bilingual anthology, um, and interesting, and I'll say more about this in a, in a minute, but the book Ul, for Mapuche Poets, an anthology, and that was translated by John Beershurst, a trilingual anthology in 1998. Uh, Vicuña's visual art has been exhibited in New York at the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art, at the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes in Buenos Aires, at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London, and she is a founding member, member of Artists for Democracy. Um, she lives in both Chile and New York, but of late, she's rarely been home as her star continues to rise. 
Once an artist that worked on the periphery of the international art circles um, and art circuit, she's become an increasingly cited figure for what we might call, in relationship to our work today, uh, global south art, or the kind of multidimensional and experimental visual art and oral art practices that exceed any one container, any one discipline, and that also enliven for us alternatives within increasingly precarious worlds. One important anchor point of Cecilia's increased visibility is the incredible retrospective ex exhibition that Julia Bryan Wilson and Andrea Anderson co-curated -cura um, in 2017. I had an opportunity to write for that catalog. It was a beautiful retrospective in the New Orleans Contemporary Museum. It was called About to Happen, and certainly she became about to happen, uh, although, again, she has this arc of 40 years of a career. Um, the work itself contained fragile bits of Vicuña's improvisational sculptures. And over the past few years, she has been busier than usual, currently with an exhibition at the Berkeley Art Museum and the Pacific Film Archive. Her work was recently uh, on exhibition at Documenta 14, as well as Luca just mentioned here in Brooklyn Art Museum. Uh, last night by phone and in Spanish, she said to me, "I." Ahora pienso que en esos días cuando había tiempo para descansar, you know? Um, it, it was so great when I had time, time to myself, time to think, time to, to rest, and those days, um, fondly thinking about those days. So for me today, I'm very excited to return to the work of Cecilia um, Vicuña and to be in conversation with her, and I'd like to, we'd also like to engage you all in conversation with us. I say return because I first met Cecilia at her Manhattan studio in 2002, she may not remember, uh, when I was finishing graduate work at UC Santa Cruz. It was there that I came across this extraordinary edited volume of poetry, Ul, for Mapuche poets. Do any of you know that edition? Of course, Maria Damon in the front row. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, this was the first collection that was ever translated into Spanish, English, and Mapuzungun, the language of indigenous peoples uh, from southern Chile and Argentina, Mapuche peoples. For me, I wanted to meet the poet behind the volume that created, in fact, in the wake of that book, global circuits of indigenous cultural production actually opened up. During the interview, I also had the opportunity, besides meeting the poet, to meet the artist, the multimedia activist, the filmmaker, and the performer. Cecilia kept pulling sweaters, fabric, and her own knitted objects out of a big baul, or a wooden chest, um, telling me stories through her objects and changing her clothes throughout the two hours we spent together. Though I won't do a costume change, we won't do a costume change today, what I do want to say is that Vicuña tells stories through her objects, and in particular focusing on how her art practice invokes a radically anti-capitalist way of perceiving beyond the coloniality and new authoritarianisms of the extractive zone. I feel like Vicuña's work creates potentials for collective forms of autonomous living in a world that has entered new levels of unsustainability and injustice. She's been working in these micro worlds and showing us how the micro connect up to these global worlds in relationship to questions like the ecology and the ocean for decades. Um, I'm also very interested, as you'll see today, in Cecilia Vicuña's edge work. She talks, she turns plastic bits and bird feathers and refuse into a revitalized art form. And that way, there's a kind of recycling and upcycling practice that's really important here. So I just want to say it's an honor to be in conversation with you today, Cecilia. Es un honor tenerle aquí, maestra. Welcome. And I look forward to our dialogue after your presentation. Thank you. So first we'll see a 10 minute clip from her work called Kiku. That was 27 <laughs> Oh, 
noches Some of my sounds, you see, I'm a snake. Do you hear this? The mice can't tell who I am. <laughs> Did you hear that? It's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> I wanted to start again. This start an S. Somebody at the sound should probably control that S, <laughs> otherwise we'll be sissing. Okay. okay. That's different, or no? <laughs> should I come to the other one? That's better. Okay, very good. So, I wanted to start with this little video called Kipu Mapocho. This video is an excerpt from a work I have been doing for the last few years, mostly two years more concentrated. And it's a work that is one work and nevertheless is spread throughout many years in the sense that each act is a knot in a singular or single piece that takes place in the landscape from the top of the mountain where the glaciers are giving birth to the river Mapocho. I was born next to that river. And that little thread of water that you see gives life to the entire valley of Santiago. As you may imagine right now, the glaciers are 
melting fast and much faster than in other places in Chile because Chileans are in the idolatry of profit in this moment in the culture established by the dictatorship and followed by the so-called democracies after the dictatorship which, which consists in giving more value to the metals extracted from the mountains than to the water. Therefore, we will soon, very soon, be without glaciers, without rivers, without water for everybody. So I have been doing this work following the water as it flows all the way from the glacier into the ocean. When you reach finally the mouth of the river, Chileans are constructing a huge mega port to honor the extractive zone, as you call it, where Chile will be converted into a nation dedicated to extracting stuff, meaning minerals, and bringing containers with rubbish from China and other places. So while they are constructing that mega port, they are destroying all forms of life in this amazing history, among them the life and culture of people who have been living there for more than 10,000 years and are and represent a continuous line of thought, a continuous line of act and thinking and being in the coastal zone of Chile. So. I wanted to show this work because as I get older and I come closer to the notion of death and the notion of death is what really initiated my art. But um, to tell you a little bit of the story of the birth of my art, um, I will move to the power. So shall we lower the lights so that we can see a little better? Yeah, that's much nicer. Okay, the next valley. Uh, that's weird. Why did you turn those lights on? They're not listening. Okay. <laughs> ah? So, um, I guess it's for you to see this creature here. There's no need. But, okay. So, ah, I know, the video. That's what it is. It's considering the people who are in other parts of the world watching us. That's why. Okay. I apologize. Perdón. Okay. Muy bien. Entonces... Here we are in the next valley, north of the valley of the Mapocho, which is the valley of the Aconcagua River. A little bit to the right of this photo is the mouth of the Aconcagua River. The Aconcagua River also comes from the Andes Mountains and comes to the Pacific Ocean in this place called Concon. Nobody knows what Kong Kong means today, and there are many controversies about that name, but I have my own reading. In the most ancient languages that we know of that existed, let's say 10,000 years ago or even more, in this area, Kong means many things. It means water, the life cycle of the water from the glacier to the ocean and back in rain and snow, and it also means the life force of the sea. It, so when in indigenous languages you have con, con, a repetition, it is an intensity. So this is a place where a lot of life was born because the sweet water and the salty water 
commit. I was a teenager of uh, 18 years old. Shall we close that door? Because that class is coming out. So I was an 18 year old teenager in the year 1966 and I was here in Concon and if you've been to the South Pacific Ocean you know how incredibly cold the air and the water is. So even though it's summer and you're half naked in your bikini there's always this tremendous cold wing, wing, no, wind, wind with wings you know, that caresses you and really pushes you in every direction. So I am there in Concon and suddenly I had the realization that has ruled my life. I understood and I felt that the wind was self-aware and the wind was playing with me, was having a lot of pressure, touching the naked girl. And the naked girl needed to say, oh, you know, there I was with the wind. And I turned around and I felt this tremendous orgasmic joy taking place in everything with everything else. The light hitting the sand, the sun hitting back in reflection, the ocean, the waves, the wind. And I fell into an extraordinary ecstatic state of full awareness of life and death. In that moment, I picked up a little piece of debris, feeling the beauty of what has died, what is gone, the beauty of the bones, of the sticks that look like bones, the beauty even of the plastic that has been floating around the ocean for thousands of miles arriving at these beaches. I do that and I pick up a stone. You see, I said a stone. I wonder why I said that. Whatever I picked, stones, sticks, I began drawing these spirals for the sea to erase. And then I began placing these little sticks and bones again for the sea to erase. I wanted to see that the sea was seeing my awareness. I wanted for this awareness to enter in a dialogue with the complete awareness around me. And I included this picture so that you see those little uh, white little balls. And even back then in the 60s, these little white things that were not exactly sand but pretended to be sand were there. They were the beginning of microplastic. The microplastic that now is inhabiting our own bodies and the entire ecosystem of this planet, killing all forms of life that have any connectivity with the ocean and the waters. And I was already aware of these little things even though they didn't have a name. You see them? These are the large ones, but if I had a macro lens, you could see that most of those little grains that are looking like sand, not all of them are sand. And you can tell because um, I trained myself as a little girl to see through. And if you look very closely at a grain of sand and you still have the sight of a child or of a young person, you can see that each grain of sand is really a crystal that reflects light. And you will probably learn as well that every beach in the planet sounds different from the other beach because the molecular configuration of the spaces between each grain of sand is different. That blows my mind. The fact that each grain of sand is like us, an individual, and at the same time is a collective. This is the core of indigenous thinking. 
And so many years go by. Now we're in 2017, and like 50 years have gone by, really, not 40. That's kind 40. But in truth, I have been doing what I do for 50 years. And so in the year 1990 or 92, can't remember exactly, at a gallery that doesn't exist anymore called Exit Art Gallery, I was invited to do my first large one-woman show in New York, and I think in the US perhaps. And so I did this piece called Pueblo de Altares. So I brought sand from a beach nearby, put it on the floor, and here I am in New Orleans recreating that piece. And so each time that this piece is recreated, I add new pieces because my precarious pieces uh, disappear. They, um, if you push them, they fall apart. If a very uh, strong person passes through it or next to it, they may uh, faint because everything that's happening is affecting their behavior. And so the concept persists, but the actual objects usually don't. They are precarious. And it was even in the 60s, in the 60s, in perhaps 66, or around that time, that I conceived the name Lo Precario, the precarious for my work. And I didn't know back then that the root of the word precario is from the Latin precis, which means prayer. And it is a prayer because it is insecure, fragile, and because it disappears. The reason why I call them precarios is because they die, or they have already died, or they're about to die. The first time that I have encountered my expression of about to happen as a definition of my work is in my book Sabora Me of 1973, where I say that my art is about to happen because what I have already done, what is done, is already dead. And where is the art then? The art is in what is about to happen. If you think of quantum physics, this is what is now called emergence. You see, it's the process of emergence that makes evolution, change and transformation and the continuity between life and death takes place. So invited to this fantastic retrospective that you mentioned, Maka, to New Orleans, I went there and first thing that I did in New Orleans was to visit the indigenous communities that have already been sunk by the floods and they have already lost their lands to climate change because so much is going under the rising waters. So I created this snake raft to escape the flood. But let's see if I have another, yes, here. But in my understanding, you can create this raft to escape the flood, but then a big wave will come hit your raft and everything will explode up in the air. So our security has already been completely, totally removed. So uh, in the last uh, two years, 17 and 18, I have published uh, four new books. And this book is so beautiful because it carries for the first time a title that I created in 73, as far as I can tell. It couldn't surprise me if I were to find it appearing even before that. But I don't often read my ancient works. And uh, because we are in Kipu hashtag territory, and because Kipu is a word that not very many people know, Kipu means not in Quechua. And here I included it because uh, in the 60s, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I had an aunt, a wonderful artist, her name was Rosa Vicuña. 
and she had uh, uh, an extraordinary collection of art books, some of them pre-Columbian art and Dada and every kind of uh, contemporary art. So it was in her place that I became educated reading uh, art books in many, many languages as she would read them and I, and I sort of imagined reading them too. And so uh, when I came across the concept of the kipu, I suppose the kipu somehow felt, and look at it, I don't speak of the kipu as an object, because the kipu is not an object, that is a Western misconception. Even the knot is not an object. A knot, from my perspective, is a piece of thread that turns around and looks at itself. Think of the shape of a knot. It is the most complex mathematical form. The analysis from the mathematical perspective of a knot is endless. I have attended whole symposiums by scientists discussing knots. It is completely uh, extraterrestrial <laughs> from, from the perspective of someone who does know the scientific language so well as myself. But I am endlessly fascinated by the poetry of science, by, by the inability to name what they really see. And that's where is kinship with poetry and with art. So uh, this kipu appears in my life, and I appear in the life of the kipu. We enter into a conversation, and I write in my notebook this phrase, el kipu que no recuerda nada. Because if you Google the word kipu, it will, in Western encyclopedias, it will say that the kipu is a recording device to, uh, as an aid in memory, as a sort of way of keeping track of what you know, whether it is a statistics, numbers, or whether it is a stories, this part of it also being used to record stories is a newer uh, distinction because for years it was just simply thought that this was a sort of like an abacus, but it ain't that. It is something much more complex than that. And uh, here is uh, what I say. El kipu que no recuerda nada is the heart of memory. The earth listening to us. In other words, you are seeing again the feedback loop between the different forms of awarenesses. And this is what the kipu really is about. Of course, no scholar of the kipu will say that. It doesn't matter. Maybe they will say it someday. Because scientists don't like this thought that art and poetry imagine things that later scientific research will find and confirm, negate, whatever. But it is the anticipatory imagination of art and poetry that takes us there. Here I am playing with the two gong cons. Gong con with C is how the location is in the geography. If you go to Chile, you're not going to find it described with KK. I do the KK just to bring the memory that there was another language that gave birth to this name. And here is, uh, I began to weave the landscape very early on. I think the first images I have of Cecilia weaving the landscape with threads are from 1981, more or less. But I have begun weaving the landscape. The first time is not, I, the first weaving, the, the first uh, spatial weaving I did actually inside my bedroom in 1970 perhaps and uh, as as life moves on and I become older I work more and more in the landscape why is this because the Incas uh, the Kipu has a story of 5,000 years but the Incas which represent perhaps the last 200 years before the conquest by the Europeans uh, they conceived of a virtual Kipu called the Seque system 
And when I learned that the kipu also existed in an intangible dimension which represented the union of all points of a culture, all points of relationship to the water and to the birth of water and to the distribution of labor and responsibilities for the care of water, I was so taken by the notion that 40 years before I learned that, or 30 years, I don't remember exactly how many decades had gone by when the young girl had already written El Kipu que no recuerda nada and imagined it as an image, only an image, not a work. It was enough to think of it for the Kipu to be present. So this is part of the core of my work, the notion of bringing back the idea that the ancient peoples of the Andes perceived all of human culture as one thing. And that is the core of how I see not only my own life and work, but even us right here. You know, the notion that we can be simultaneously an individual that is unlike anybody else and simultaneously part of a collective body is what makes me do what I do because I believe that unless we become fully aware of the fact that we are one species, we're not going to be able to move to a new dimension of human culture devoted to caring for this earth and for each other. That's it. presentación me pareció muy profundo todo lo que me estaba diciendo, todo lo que me estaba contando. Y quería volver al tema en cuanto a la dictadura, un momento tal vez de ruptura, un momento tal vez de mucha violencia colectiva, que rompe ese esquema colectivo muy fuertemente. No sé si puede hablar un poco de eso y el arte que surge justamente en ese momento. So thank you, Cecilia, so much for your presentation. I found it very deep. Um, and uh, for now, I want also to go back to the moment of dictatorship, which I found it's uh, a moment also of profound uh, fracture. So we're going to go ahead and start that conversation. Te contesto en español? Perhaps how, how many of you speak Spanish here? So uh, not enough people, so I will answer in English. How about that? Or do you think I should answer in Spanish? No, como quiera. Bueno, un poquito de cada uno, a little bit of each, okay? So yes, it is true. I think the true purpose of the military coup in Chile, which was September 11, 1973, was to kill exactly what I just said, the notion that it was shared by millions of people in Chile that you could be simultaneously an individual and form part of the collective body that move as one to achieve justice, to achieve social change, to achieve uh, laws that would protect and defend the rights of people and the rights of the land and so forth. And so when that link was broken, then the people of Chile could be enslaved. Uh, this was only possible through electrocuting people's vaginas, people's penises and eggs, we call them eggs, the balls, you know, and this was done to thousands and thousands of people, so not only people were made to disappear, but also were electrocuted in um, arbitrarily, you know, if you happen to be in the notebook 
of someone who was imprisoned, you would also go into these torture chambers just because you happen to be in the telephone book of somebody. You know, so they use this terror system to destroy that connectivity between people, between history, and people between your dreams and other people's dreams. So you're asking me for the art that was born at the time. My art began to be suppressed and erased completely uh, the minute the military coup occurred. This was, as I say, in 73. And it's actually been erased until now. Only now a few elements of my work have begun to appear. And a, a group of people uh, emerged that um, at the time in the late 70s that decided to call themselves El Colectivo de Acciones de Arte. And uh, this was not the only group, but it's one of the few groups that is known because they had a fantastic propaganda machine. Uh, some of them worked in publicity, and they were super smart in letting their work be known. And I came across them because they invited me to collaborate with them even before they created that name for themselves. And they had become aware of works that I had done in Chile in the late 60s and early 70s and wanted for me to contribute to their work. Part of that work was um, breaking through the public sphere that was surveilled by the dictatorship. And that was a large project, and it was a project of um, militarization. And I'm curious, you worked in the micro, and you continue to work in the micro, but showing us what could happen to the kind of fragile spheres of life and death by showing very close-up cropped views, say, of your hands and spilling milk and what that means in the larger significations. Can you talk about what it means to work in that close-up view, that cropped view that you have in a lot of your work. Yeah, it, it is true that the, the fragmentary view is at the same time a connectivity to get to the cosmic dimension. And I think, just as I was saying, that you, if you are aware that you are simultaneously uh, many uh, creatures in the sense that your awareness is yours, but at the same time, no awareness is just yours. You are aware because people and even bacteria are self-aware. You know, even now we know that subatomic particles are aware and self-aware. So this awareness is what makes our awareness possible. And I think when you work in the fragmentary view, you are being like one of these bacteria. You see, bacteria, for example, when they, they think that each one is a single little creature, and when they realize that a whole quorum of them is there, they sing and they light up. And that's how it felt to be in a revolutionary situation in Chile. People lighted up, everybody lighted up when you were sharing this collective. So when I am working in the loneliness of being suppressed, censored, for decade after decade, decade after decade, I never lose sight that these acts that you do in loneliness reverberate and resonate with everything that is living and everything that is in other dimension. And I think that is what kept me going. And the fact that I am here sitting with you, that we can have this conversation, is proof that somehow, despite the loneliness, how do these things communicate with each other. Now we know that that's how the world works. For example, uh, it has recently been published that um, evolution is not at all like Darwin believed. It's not vertical and through the genealogy of genes, but it's also horizontal, transversal, and you can be affected by a bacteria, a virus that will affect your DNA even without touching you. So there is some forms of communication between living things that we haven't yet discovered. I think it's the same with art and with poems. I know, for example, I have always had the sense that I write an image in a poem, I put it away, I even forget it, I don't show it to anyone, 
but I know that I will encounter that image in somebody else's poem, written before, during, or after my writing. Because there is no time as, and space of the regular order, ordinary order, in the conception and realization of an image. So that point you just made about a time-space continuum, I think is a really, um, provides anchoring points for a lot of your work. And part of the ebb and flow that you are playing at the edge with the Pacific Ocean, or the kind of questions of erasure and objects under erasure, or the questions of fragility and precarity, um, there are questions also of t time and space. Can you say a little bit more about the themes that animate your work and that continue to either haunt you or persist or um, be elaborated as you continue in this five decade search? Yeah, I think I spoke already a little bit about death, but what's the point of being concerned with what disappears? I think the point is birth. You see, the point is transformation and renewal. And the point is uh, an ancient idea that uh, everything needs to dissolve for something new to come, you know? And I think in all these acts, what moves me is, is, is something that could be called a prayer. And, but it's not a prayer in the religious sense of appealing to something that is beyond us, but it's a prayer for what is, for what is to, to know that you know. Because this notion of the, of the feedback of awarenesses that are speaking to each other is something that I continually uh, experience. And uh, for example, uh, I just did a performance on Sunday. I don't know if any one of you was present at the, you were there, Maria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that was lovely. And uh, you see, when I do a performance, I put into practice the idea of about, about to happen. The idea that I don't know what the performance is going to be because nobody in the audience knows either. So none of us knows. And from the not knowing of all of us, it is as if a weaving of uh, images begins to emerge. And it is that kind of intangible weaving that has the power to create new realities. So the driving idea is the creation of new realities. It's not an exercise that is nostalgic. I have been ridiculed so often, um, especially in South America, especially in Chile, especially by people of my generation, uh, as, oh, uh, Cecilia works with indigenous ideas to send something archaic, something that, what's the point of that? Like it is a romantic, stupid idea. And I think, how can that be romantic, you know, when you are seeing the effects of what looks like something that is a complete nothing? Because my work is nothing. It's really nothing. And that nothing keeps emerging, keeps coming forth, keeps doing things. Who's doing it? It's not me. Is it you looking at it? Is the interaction? See, this is again indigenous thinking. Indigenous thinking is that what is real is the interactions. What is real is the relationship. And this is the most decolonizing idea that ever was, because nobody owns it. You see, nobody can control it, because I cannot tell you how you feel when you're going to be feeling what you feel or what you think when I speak, you see. And that is the beauty, the fact that it can't be controlled. Mm. And when you work in the space of what cannot be controlled, it's like, <sighs> you know, it's like something when you see have you seen how, for example, a caterpillar gives birth? You know, it sort of breaks open like that. That is what happens when a work emerges. Something is pushing forth. Something that is ha has its own agency. 
its own force. And what is your role? You are like a witness. And you participate because the witnessing also affects the, the relationship, see? And in the Andean perspective, the kipu is a witness. The knot is a witness, but it's a witness to what? To the doing. So is the doing, you see what I mean? Is, is I get very carried away with this thing, sorry. <laughs> So when you talk about the kipu and the weaving as a practice, um, as an embodied practice that's in relationship and dialogue with landscape, that's very interesting. It brings up a lot of questions around representations of memory, thinking about the past, thinking about how the past is represented within these spaces that you're working in. Um, but in this film, what I saw was also weaving as representation of the Anthropocene, as representation of human intervention, as the red tide and the expansion of the red tide or the algae blooms that are happening right across the globe um, right now. So can you say more about how you place and work with weaving in relationship to landscape, which I find really um, evocative and always changing across the different mediums that you're working with? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating issue even to myself because um, why did I begin doing that, you know? And um, I remember the first time that I became aware that I was weaving the landscape. I had been prevented from going to South America for a few years because um, uh, uh, visa problems. In me, like I'm a grand, my grand person and so I couldn't get my, my visa organized. So when I finally find myself in the Andes again, I was in a little a stream, a, a little river in the mountains, and suddenly uh, I found a, a, a thread, like some fishing uh, kids had uh, this little thread. And so I picked up this thread and I began weaving the two sides of the river. And I went under the rocks, under the water, and I began feeling perhaps I am healing my separation from this land. Maybe I am uniting north and south. Maybe what am I really doing? Or what is this weaving doing to me and doing to the landscape? You know, and so I think this, this weaving, uh, when I was telling you about the, 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 the interrelationships as being the form of awareness that we need to really pay attention to, I think that's what it is. Because these weavings are completely impermanent. And what is the point of weaving in the landscape? Is listening to it. And the water wants to be listened to. The land, the plants, everything wants to be listened to because we are killing everything. And we are the killers. It's not something that's killing them. It's we, you know, it's us. So it's some acknowledgement of our role there. And in ancient times, people wove with the opposite purpose, with the purpose of establishing a connection for this connection to be the guiding force. So we are destroying everything because we have decided that the disconnection is what rules. So it's, again, it's a question of life and death. I think I want to ask one more question and then open it up to the students and audience. Um, you work in so many mediums. You work in poetry, performance, sculpture. You work in video and film. You are a prolific writer. You speak, you install. Um, you're an activist. How do you do all of this? Um, how do you do all of this? And what advice can you offer You know, our students, um, who are working and trying to either become curators or think about their art practice in particular ways, how does one develop enough specialization and enough knowledge and enough history in a particular discipline, but then explode those disciplines in the way that you have done? Yeah, uh, yeah I wouldn't advise it because <laughs> it, it really um, is a wonderful thing, but it's a dreadful thing at the same time. For example, one of the reasons why I have been suppressed all my life is precisely for the reason that this is appealing and interesting and important to you because you are a forward-thinking person 
changing paradigms. That's why you see it this way. But for many years, I have to say that poets ridicule me because well, she's really an artist, an artist. Well, she's really a poet, you know. So, but the point for from my perspective is that uh, the doing itself doesn't have categories uh, because the doing is above all undefined, and we in the West call it art, we call it poetry, but most peoples, historically, peoples who have lived and have been human for two and a half million years, they didn't have such names or categories as art, or as we now have different categories of specialization. It was the doing that needed to be aware of itself. So if you want to embark on something risky and dangerous, like doing many things that you don't really know how to do well, beware that you may find yourself very alone. And at the same time, that aloneness uh, is a huge challenge. Because uh, once you're alone, you have very many choices. You can become resentful. You can become depressed. You can become an imbecile. You can become egocentric. You can become all those things. But if you stay afloat in the state of accepting that the learning is infinite, then the fact that you may not do things so well, for example, in my work, everything is badly done, poorly done. When I started to paint, my father was so annoyed. He said, what's the point of teaching you about the Italian Renaissance and the Giotto and all this magnificent art if you're going to be painting like that? You know? And it's true, it was bad painting. And this bad painting was ridiculed for 40 years. And now they are becoming now grand works that are going into magnificent museums around the world, all of a sudden, what happened? How come that the same painting was despised and then became a masterwork? Mm -hmm. Ah, you see, you have to, you know, have the stamina to be with yourself during the time that you're dwelling in the not doing things well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So now I'd love to open it up, maybe first to the students and then to others, faculty. Yes. Please introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Miami. Did you say Yes. Hi. I'm Alexia Lario. I'm a sophomore in critical and visual studies. Uh, first of all, thank you. That was really enlightening. Um, I had a question about the sound in Kipu Mapocho because uh, there was a combination of the sounds of the water and then vocalizing. And from the vocalizing, I definitely had a sense of uh, that it was about to happen because it kind of was really unexpected, especially when it collapsed into kind of more gasping and like sobbing. And so I was wondering if those sounds were improvised in relation to the imagery or like what the process was of recording it. So in relation to the entry? The imagery. The imagery. Uh, no. Uh, the sounds, or actually, it's very hard to be true, huh? um, because we distort things as we're trying to speak them. And uh, the reality of this sound is that while I was up, both in the glacier and in the river mouth, um, I usually uh, begin working uh, with sounds. And then I start the weaving and so forth. Or sometimes I also sing afterwards. So I climb to the glacier with two people, my camera and sound person, and a friend of mine that also is a researcher and ethnomusicologist who is the male voice that sings along with me. So once we reach the glacier, we follow the same path. Did you see that there was a little child in the film? That child was sacrificed 500 years ago at the top of this mountain, this glacier, at the birthplace of this river. And as I say at the end of the film, I'm sorry I didn't put it in English, 
uh, the child gave his life for the water to flow eternally. I was eight years old when this boy was dug out and sold to the Natural History Museum of Chile as if he were an object. And from that moment forward, the, only, the few people that know about this story think that that's when the river began to dry. You know? and, but what is the relationship between the singing and the doing and the landscape itself? Is the sound is doing things that you're not controlling, that you're not thinking, things that you're feeling. So it's the pain. While I was there, I was there because this was at 3,800 meters above sea level. The glacier melted this much in four hours, this much. I mean, that's how fast it's going. So I'm witnessing the melting. <laughs> the drops going faster, faster, faster. And you want to die of sadness, you know? And at the same time, uh, the, the child died there, and we're following his steps, so we're honoring the beauty of sacrifice, of the sacrifice for others, which is something that our culture has completely denied, and they look at them as barbaric. But from their perspective, that was not a barbaric act. It was an act of love, you know, love for the future, love for what's coming. Oh, shit. Sorry. I always feel very loud, but I guess I'm not. Um, you, you had said something to the effect of, you were talking about the driving idea as the creation of new realities. And this seems to me a fairly ambivalent uh, thing to throw out there in the sense that the new realities that we can create can be very regressive and damaging and violent and hurtful in the way that we see now with quote unquote fake news and a lot of what's going on in politics. And they can also be very optimistic and hopeful and challenging. And I'm wondering, especially in, in, in a space, a public space as anarchic and kind of unregulated as the World Wide Web, I'm wondering how, what you would suggest to our students who really want to believe in this vision of progress, to actually create something and put something out there in material form in the world, but oftentimes either feel overwhelmed or subsumed under the kind of violence of creation in a negative sense as opposed to the beauty of creation in a positive or, or evolutionary sense. So I'm just wondering how basic, I don't know, what you might say to someone who's feeling a little uh, yeah. discouraged at art school at the age of 21. Yeah, thank you, yes. I think that is a very, very important thing that if we become aware that we are creating realities by everything, I mean, it's already known by everybody that you create realities by shopping. You create realities by choices. You create realities by your thoughts, by your feelings, by going with your resentment, by going with your rage, or by going with your desire to be of help, your desire to uh, support the forces and be part of the forces that are transforming things to benefit others. And so this, I think, the, uh, just as the awareness of the relationship is a key to move forward. Uh, what is the point of the metaphor of weaving? Is the idea of union, the idea of conjoining with others. Because uh, you see, the, the system we live in is forcing us to be completely separate, and people are separated by technology. The technology that is supposed to be weaving people together is simultaneously separating people, making people less aware of each other, less aware of their surroundings. So it's a form of enslavement at the same time. So becoming aware of the power of your own awareness, I think, is, is number one. And the power of the quality of the relationship. This is the lesson of indigenous thinking above every other one. It is the most radical one that you have to exchange 
beauty, you have to exchange solidarity, you have to, this, this idea, for example, you see a lot of talk about resistance. Resistance, in my view, is a separating notion because it reinforces the idea that they are doing something to us, you know, and that is not going to do it. What is going to do it is to find what are the forces mobilizing us towards the goodness of this earth, the goodness of what people are requiring. People require water, people require clean food. Um, for me, uh, I failed to tell you when you asked me about the weaving. Um, for example, uh, I have become aware of the insects being the weavers of life in this planet. And insects are really the weavers. Bacteria are the weavers. So all our ancient metaphors, for example, I have written many times uh, about language, uh, because language is one of my passions. And what makes language exist is a sort of intangible weaving that connects words and concepts that is beyond syntaxis, that is beyond telepathy. Something in language that is not language makes language possible. And so that, I think, is what the metaphor of weaving the web of life. So again, is awareness of your intent and how the intent translates to action. And if we do that, then there is the possibility of mobilization, you know. And with mobilization, there's then the chance of being killed, of being in prison, you know. But um, what can we do? You know, uh, so many of my girlfriends and boyfriends, I was 24 when the military coup occurred, you know. I lost so many of them, members of my family too. And those of us who somehow escaped, I was in London when the coup happened, you know. And so I remember my first emotion, not being there, was uh, I wanted to die too, you know. This is a common thing that for survivors, that survivors feel rotten about having survived. Like you did something bad, you know, that something that you didn't deserve. And that put me down for many, many years until somehow, I don't know what, uh, I suppose, I went, I began going to, to the forest, to the rainforest, to Amazonia, to the mountains. I began working with indigenous communities. And that's where I think I understood that they had not been defeated. And when I tell you that, my hair under the sweater still stands up. So um, one of the, the kind of key concepts I'm hearing, well, one of the concepts that I'm particularly drawn to as well or thinking about lately is um, um, awareness. And, um, you know, my question is about self-awareness, right? That, um, so, okay, more broadly, let me start over again. More broadly about the concept of awareness um, and is this, related to consciousness? Is this related to sentience? Um, and if we're talking about self-awareness, the idea of individuality is so contaminated at the moment, you know what I mean, by this liberal notion of possessive individualism. So I'm not asking this all that clearly, but um, Maybe there's five questions in there, but if you could maybe say some more about this concept of awareness yeah. and, um, and everything, because I'm inspired by that, you know, idea that everything is aware, and that's so powerful to me, you know, that, that idea, so. Yeah, it is true. Um, I can't tell you how I relate to it, because in your question, it's a question for humanity. You see, because we loosely use all those words, consciousness, do we really know what that is? Do we really know what awareness is? We don't, you see. That's what I mean, that inside language, there are many other dimensions that we have yet to explore. And I think this is what is most deeply human, the desire 
to explore, to know, to understand what cannot be understood or known. And for example, the way I relate to words, I was a, a teenager, uh, more or less at the same time, actually the same year that I began doing the work in the beach. I usually speak of that, and I don't speak of what I'm going to speak now, which was just equally um, a, a realization that rules my life to this day, is I suddenly saw a word as a creature, an entity, and it opened up. And through that word, I could see all the way to the Big Bang. What kind of Big Bang? Not the Big Bang that the scientists and astronomers think about, but the Big Bang of a, an explosion of consciousness that made this word come up. And so when I felt that, that's possible for every single word that is spoken. You know, it's like something opened. The question opened. The ability to question. So inside the word awareness, A, W, E, O, O, look at my mouth, O. The proto root of that word is a mouth, is a hole, is an opening, is something to go through. You know, so it's a representation of perception. Now, for example, neuroscience studies the awareness of babies. They are born with this extraordinary awareness. They're inside the womb and they're already aware, you see. And so this awareness constitutes our humanity. And think of the culture we live in is completely focused on erasing all forms of awareness. People are with their earphones to be instructed as to what they have to shop, what they have to think. So this awareness becomes really what needs to be blunt, what blunted, can you say that? What needs to be, what's the word? Uh, uh, Dulled, thank you. You see, so that the sharp edges of this awareness, which is where the awareness wants to go, where it hasn't been, like, you remember the Star Trek? Go where, <laughs> what's the, the funny thing that they say? That one, you know? And so, that's what awareness wants to do. So, if we become aware of this awareness, and we go with it, it will show us. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I was really interested in what you said about a kipu not being an object. Um, and I wonder if you could say more of, about that, because I, I found myself thinking then, well, is anything an object? Um, and, and I kind of thought that maybe I'm wrong that your answer would be no. Um, and, you know, or, or, or thinking that maybe what you meant by that is that it's a, it's a relationship or it's an act, um, that it, it's even a, a magical act, that it's, an, it's not an object because it's precarious, uh, because it's alive. Um, and, and so, you know, the question, the, the, the question that I have, not just is anything an object, which would be a yes or no question, um, is, is also, you know, coming from, you know, among people who make objects, how do you, you know, how do you make objects that, that, that are not objects, that, that are alive, you know, that are magical? Is it because they're of their precarity or their relationships or, you know, is, is this, is this, something that you can advise us about as makers of objects. My God, if I ever could imagine that I would be asked something like that, huh? uh, when I thought those thoughts, can you imagine the little girl thinking these thoughts and then finding herself as an older woman and being asked, how did you do that? It's like, how did you fart? 
I mean, how did this come about? You know, it came about. But um, uh, I think you, you answer yourself in the sense that you already know what you're asking me, in the sense that if you're struck by, the, by, by that phrase, it's because you already sense it. And everybody does, given the chance. Because I wrote once, uh, an object is not an object, it is the witness to a relationship. You know? Because this is valid, even stars decompose. You know, galaxies decompose. Everything is born and everything dies, and that's the beauty of it. So when you create an art form, it doesn't matter at what speed it will rot or it will disappear. But if you want to be aware that you're using toxic materials, you just have to know that you are using toxic materials that would have an effect on who touches them or who disposes of them and so forth. And in the current world that we live, it's practically impossible to avoid toxicity. I am completely poisoned with metals because I painted with oils for a long time in my life. Now what am I doing as an old woman? I'm painting again. You see, it's like I want to be toxic again. But why? You see, it's, it's like we are on this edge. How can we move away from toxicity while still being toxic? You know, it's, it's a huge challenge and we don't know the answer. But collectively, if we all ask that question, the question will come of its own accord. You know, because questions uh, and things that are not solvable have an energy. And this energy is something that we need to pay attention to because it's an energy full of credit. So it's going to be a challenge. I'm very curious to read the Twitter feed on all of this in Spanish and English, how to translate this incredible conversation and your responses um, on tweets. So thank you, Wendy and Zap, for doing that. Y también tratando de hacer un espacio, crear un espacio multilingüe. We are the Global South Center. We believe in multilingualism, and that's part of the work that you've been doing here in your work. And um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.